Sorry to be all serious. Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think that we do this all the time, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people get visions when they work with the plants about futures, possible futures, and, and once again, like, I find, you know, although we're in a 2012 conference, and I wrote a book titled 2012, you know, I'm not, like, um, that um, obsessed with the concept of 2012, you know, because I feel like we, 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 we're in in the now, we're in the prophecy moment right now. We don't really need to put it on to some, you know, imaginable future point. And once again, this Lakota guy talked about um, our tendency towards salvation point mentality, where we think there's some point outside of us, some force beyond us that, uh, you know, or some time ahead of us where this change is going to happen, you know, whereas it's, it's actually, you know, is happening. And, and the, the, the more we... Um, you know, recognize that the more we can participate uh, in it. You know, one thing that I really love about John Major Jenkins' uh, rap on the, the, the Mayan stuff is uh, the idea that the, the ball game, you know, was about getting this ball through the ring, which symbolized this alignment in 2012, the sun going through the dark rift. So you'd think that's something that's just happening, but what the metaphor of the ball game is saying is that it's not just happening, it's something that the, that the human players, meaning us, have to work you know, as hard as possible and as creatively and as cunningly as possible to, to make happen properly, you know? Can you, can you take, a, take, there's a mic, you can, you want to just line up behind him, take the next question or come over here? That was my friend's message, but it definitely applies for me too, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that uh, it's just like a, uh, a way to put out the mirror and uh, also to open up the whole room and the whole universe? I mean, if you have the room, it's like, okay, where is your room? Uh -huh. So, so just for people who haven't read the book, um, I've done Iboga or Ibogaine twice. Does everybody know what Iboga is? Okay, so, um, you know, there's um, the only kind of classical psychedelic that they found in Africa is Iboga, which is uh, found in the equator in West Africa, in uh, Gabon and uh, Cameroon. And um, it's um, a long, probably the longest lasting psychedelic. It lasts like 15 or 20 hours uh, or more, really. It has a number of phases in it. It can often be very uh, psychoanalytic. Like when I took it, I went back through early childhood. The first time I went back through all these early childhood memories and so on. It, it also has a powerful, um, it seems to have a powerful anti-addictive uh, property. So it's actually being studied in the West under the name of Ibogaine, I-B-O-G-A-I-N-E, -E, as an experimental treatment modality for addiction, uh, especially heroin addiction, but also alcoholism, cocaine, and so on. And uh, there are clinics in Canada and Mexico which are, which are working with this. And I, anecdotally, I have friends who, um, you know, have, have stopped uh, heroin addiction through uh, working with Ibogaine, usually several times, um, you know, over, over a course of a year or something, but have, 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 have totally stopped uh, doing that drug, which obviously we know is very difficult to stop otherwise. And so it seems to have both psychological and kind of neurochemical um, capacities to, to work with addicts and, and change their uh, behavior modalities. So I went down and did it a second time in Mexico with a friend of mine who was a uh, heroin addict. And uh, we both had, during our visions that time, like a voice that was like the aboga voice speaking in our head, giving us different messages. 
And at one point during his trip, uh, he uh, saw what would happen to him if like, he didn't stop using heroin. He saw himself becoming like a funky old janitor, like gnarly, like nothing going right, and just getting more and more decadent and you know, degraded and so on. And then he was, you know, at one point he was like, oh, Iboga, you know, oh, I want to help humanity. I want to save, you know, I want to help people. You know, what can I do? And this stern voice came in his head and said, clean up your room. So that's what he was asking about. And um, yeah, I mean, I think there's different levels of metaphor, but you know, for him, cleaning up your room was also like taking care of his body and getting rid of this addictive agent. But his room was a total mess. He lived in a pigsty, so it was awesome advice for him. You know? <laughs> he had like porno magazines and like horrible, you know, drawings on the walls and everything, you know, so. Um, well, okay, so, you know, um, I think it's, you know, anything's on the table. You know, we, we have, um, you know, I think that what we're seeing, I mean, there's a kind of 6,000-year um, virus of uh, empire, uh, which is this kind of dominator hierarchical mentality. And um, it's, it's, you know, at this point sort of parted company with reality and, and has reached like the, the, the terminal stage, you know. And so like um, if you think about it as a, as a virus, this, this whole urge to control, to dominate nature, to dominate other people, you know, then, then you know, that's really where we're at, you know, I think. And, and you know, I, I could see, I would see that the audio, autoimmune response of the earth involves, uh, you know, reviving like shamanic practice, uh, you know, which is kind of like, you know, bringing back in the subtle energies and, and the astral forces and so on. And then also, you know, redeveloping uh, resilient local communities to, to you know, that are, that are interdependent and, and can counteract this kind of uh, authoritarian, uh, violent, uh, psychotic mentality, which is, uh, you know, out of control, you know. Now, now, in this period that we're in now, you know, with the uh, destruction of the capitalist system and with this, um, you know, military insanity, you know, it, it seems highly likely and, and a lot of the prophecies seem to also support that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so I think that, you know, anything is possible in the next couple of years and, and you know, basically all, they, the only card they have is uh, fear and control. You know, so so they're just going to keep, you know, hitting that card again and again. You know, and um, you know, I mean, I, I certainly hope that uh, uh, Obama wins and there's a change in, in tone in in this country. Uh, but I do think that it's possible that it's going to go in a different direction. You know, if if some of the ideas around you know, 9-11, the counter, counter narratives about what happened then have validity, you know, th then, um, you know, we're looking at a, a totally ruthless uh, power mechanism that is going to give its last, you know, breath to hold on to, to the, the mechanisms of control and power. And, but, you know, that could be a, a, a short story. You know, I mean, I look at, um, I've been reading a lot about the history of uh, nonviolent uh, activism, civil disobedience, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and you know we, we've, we've lost that track in this country, but that can you know um, spontaneously uh, reemerge. You know, and, and that's really been like um, the, the most powerful uh, counterforce to uh, domination uh, that's emerged in the, in the last century. And um, um, you know, if you look at you know situations like the the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, you know we have all these political analysts who are part of our establishment, who are paid tons of money, think tanks, and so on. None of them were predicting the fall of the Berlin Wall. None of them predicting the peaceful dissolution of that boundary. You know, and and so why did that happen? Well, it happened because on, on the level of consciousness, people couldn't have that wall anymore. They they were past it, and and when that assertion of the will of the people happened, um, it also meant that the, the military stood down. You know, so, so, though, you know the, so the force that was supposed to hold that divide and hold that wall together just, just dissolved. You know, so I think what we might see in this current situation is some, is some uh, very um, horrific uh, attempts 
by the, uh, you know, the powers that be, that are soon to be the powers that were, to hold on to the, the, the system that's worked for them and that it's going to require a uh, assertion of, of uh, human will on a popular level that, that would uh, make that, uh, you know, no longer effective. But it could happen pretty quickly, a year or two, you know. And, and then we really have to get to the serious work of um, salvaging the uh, planet. You know, I mean, we have to get beyond this cartoonish uh, situation that we're in. It's it's disgusting at this point. You know that that our media could be uh, so pathetic, and and you know that we're letting the species die out. You know that we're not using our uh, technical and creative capacities to uh, to really address what's happening on this planet systemically. And we know that the tools and the techniques and technologies are available. You know whether it's bioremediation, design science. You know new social models, you know, the, there's so much waiting out there, but this dominator force is, is acting as, as a, you know, a suppressive agent, which is, which is not allowing us to make use of our uh, creative and scientific capacities on a species level to, to make this transformation that has to happen now. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that because uh, you mentioned about how the political system being what it is that, you know, it goes way beyond who gets elected because of the history of how the politics has been created and everything. And so um, I was going to ask you how much of our energy do you think it's worth actually trying to, you know, work with our government or do you think we're, you know, like in a sense wasting our time because you know, even like now we're hearing about how the Dalai Lama with his non-violence um, rhetoric is kind of putting his hands up in the air and saying, I give up. But what concerns me the most is um, what you've just been talking about, is how the government is, is clamping down so much on anybody who wants to form any kind of a community or a group. You end up with somebody like Code Pink who are all about peace and now they're a terrorist organization. So if we want to start building community in the ways that you have um, described, um, can you give us some advice on, on how we can, you know, deal with our government? Because that's kind of scary. Well, I mean, the whole situation with the government may also be about to change profoundly because, I mean, a lot of the reports that I've been reading and studying suggest that the government may be kind of bankrupt, you know, by the summer, you know. So the attempt to um, impose, you know, martial law, a federal level control, they may want to do it. They may have the, you know, the worst intentions in the world to make everybody's life a living hell. But the, um, you know, the, the, the money to support that kind of operation operation may not really be available, you know? So we may see a, a temporary, I mean, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't really want you to take this as, you know, as I said, a belief system, or I know, but it, if it would be possible that we're going to see a temporary collapse more into, like, regional systems of authority. You know, so we may get a South which becomes the theor theocratic uh, dictatorship that they, many people there seem to want, you know, let them have that, you know, and, and, then, and then the North and the East will, you know, experiment with other forms of regional systems, you know. And, um, yeah, so, you know, it's obviously a dance, you know, like, um, um, I mean, I don't know about Code Pink being a terrorist organization. I mean, I don't think like any of them are in prison right now, Jody Evans or whatever. Well, they, you know, so, so they keep experimenting with their language techniques of uh, sorcery to, uh, you know, fuck shit up, you know. But, but at a certain point, they're getting a pushback, and, and then they're not able to do, you know, the, what, they, what they seem to want to try to do, you know. So, you know, so that's where, for me, it's also, a, a, you know, there's a, there's a um, battle on the level of kind of language and, and, and culture taking place. And, you know, I, I really uh, think that people shouldn't think... Um, oppositionally or, you know, ag aggressively, they should think kind of tantrically and co-optively, you know, and because and there is no other. A and, uh, you know, as we go deeper into this crisis, that's going to become more and more apparent to more and more people. Like one of the... Um, like after uh, New Orleans happened, you know, a bunch of people from the Rainbow family went to Miss Miss Biloxi, Mississippi, and there's great videos of this online, and they built a geodesic dome, they created a kitchen, and this area was known as Miss a Hippie, you know, because hippies would go down there and get beaten up or thrown out or whatever, but suddenly the Rainbow family were the only people who came down and cared for them, you know, and they had like parades to celebrate their community, and, you know, people loved it, but they were also totally confused, you know, 
So, so transition and chaos are opportunities to change the cultural story and, and the cultural narrative, you know, and, and the way really to um, change people is to, uh, you know, do something that helps them, you know, tangibly, not just talk about spirituality or, you know, UFOs or astral dimensions, but actually to like get in there and, and, and you know, be their real friends, you know.